I haven't really thought very hard about what qualifies for this show, but I get questions sometimes, so I want to be real clear about this. Not every unsuccessful album is a train record. Um, for example, Cyndi Lauper. First Cyndi Lauper album, huge. Second one wasn't really as good and didn't do quite as well, and then the third album did kind of bad, and she kind of goes away after that, and she shifts to work to other media. That's normal. That's a perfectly typical arc for a pop star. All careers end, and except for an elite few, no one finishes theirs on top. The name of the show is Train Records. I'm looking for truly colossal disasters. It's got to be something a little more noteworthy than just any old album that doesn't sell. But we're going to make an exception today. If there is any band on earth who shouldn't be on a show about spectacular failures, it is Hootie and the Blowfish, because they weren't a spectacular anything. With a little love and some tenderness. One of the least pretentious and, let's be honest, least ambitious rock bands of the 90s, Hootie and the Blowfish's sound was so middle of the road, it was like they'd scientifically pinpointed the exact mathematical center of the road with quantum precision. And it's weird, because on paper, they had a number of distinguishing characteristics, like their many hit singles, their front man's distinct and sometimes overwrought vocals, the very fact of having a black singer in a lily white genre, and just one of the stupidest names in the history of rock. And yet, despite that, they never seemed more than just a bar band. Bunch of regular guys with a band. Nothing at all particularly amazing about them, except for one major thing. They sold 20 million records. Even for the 90s, when the record industry was still swimming in money, the number of CDs moved by this one band was absolutely nuts. In the year 1995 alone, they sold 12 million copies of their debut album, Cracked Rear View. According to the New York Times, one out of 27 Americans own at least one of their albums. That sounds like it can't be true. But trust me, I was there. They were actually that big. Even my father, who did not listen to modern rock, bought that album. Hootie crossed demographics, made oceans of cash. Hootie and the Blowfish was America's band. And then, they weren't. Back at I've joked before that Hootie's second album might as well have been shipped directly into the UCD rack. I don't know if anyone at the time realized this was a career killer, but history has written it off as one of the slumpiest sophomore slumps ever recorded. No one was predicting it'd do crack rear view numbers, but Hootie took a staggering 80% drop in sales. Even the title, Fairweather Johnson, seemed to predict how fickle the Hootie craze was. We're, you know, hoping that in 10 years we'll still be together and that people can look back at that point and say, you know, well, they, they put out five really good albums. Mm hmm hmm Yeah, no. By the end of 1996, it already seemed like everyone had written off the Blowfish as a regrettable error best left in the past. And even Hootie's defenders nowadays don't really have any interest in revisiting their unloved follow-up. Except me. Because I gotta know, how does a band sell 12 million records in one year and then just disappear? How? How, 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 how? Well, slowly but surely, with a little love and some tenderness, we will find an answer for how and why the Hootie phenomenon ended just as bafflingly and abruptly as it started. <sighs> this is Train Records. <laughs> Every so often, a writer will get this kind of bug in their head, just like a dare to themselves, a challenge. Like, can I write a whole novel without using the letter E? Can I write an all-access celebrity profile interview with Kanye West that's just me reading his Twitter feed? Or here's one. Can I make a whole 20-minute video about Hootie and the Blowfish's second album and make it interesting? It's a tough assignment. I can't promise you I'm going to succeed. I guess I wanted to do this just because of one thing, which is the only reason this album qualifies for the show. I'm just fascinated by the sheer depth of the plunge. When you take a cracked rear view back at Hootie Mania, it does not make a whole lot of sense. And the Grammy goes to, oh my other homeboys, Hootie and the Blowfish. And then, basically immediately following this Grammy ceremony, they vanish from the face of the earth. How could they have turned out to be such a flash in the pan 
when they had so little flash? Well, the easy conclusion to make about their downfall is that they were fucking lame and we all snapped to our senses. Certainly after a year of overplay, Hootie and the Blowfish had become Hootie and the Backlash real quick. I mean, they were so corny and edgeless. In lead singer Darius Rucker's own words, People hate us cause we don't write songs about how much we hate our parents. I assume that's how he said it. But I feel like lameness alone doesn't really cover it. The Counting Crows, Matchbox 20, Three Doors Down, these were all on hit bands and they all managed to have big hits after their first album. Nickelback had tons of backlash and their fans are still ride or die. For Hootie to have that steep a drop off, they must have really alienated their fans by radically altering their sound. That's still clearly Hootie. Not gonna mistake that for any other band in the universe. Actually, why don't we back up? What made this earnest and straightforward group of frat bros so big to begin with? When we talk about 90s rock, we're usually talking about grunge and post-grunge and alternative. But that stuff was actually burning itself out by the mid-90s because of drugs and death and general messiness, and the world was just getting tired of shit being heavy all the time. People forget that there was also another rootsier rock scene that really came into its own in the early 90s. Melissa Etheridge, Sheryl Crow, Clapton Unplugged, you know, VH1 rock. And crossing over between those two scenes, there was of course R.E.M. After about a decade of being the best college rock band in America, R.E.M. improbably broke through in the early 90s and became superstars. They were huge and hugely influential, but there was always going to be limits on how big they got. Like Nirvana, they were weird and abstract and uncomfortable with being mainstream. And their intersection with pop stardom came from very uncharacteristic songs like Everybody Hurts and Shiny Happy People. It wasn't the kind of thing they could sustain for very long. So that's where Hootie comes in. We'd like to drink this to R.E.M. because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be a band and this is for them. Hootie and the Blowfish counted R.E.M. as their main influence, but they were not nearly as oblique. So they filled in the gap for anyone who liked mandolins, but could do without confusing lyrics about Andy Kaufman and shit like that. And considering the early 90s was also the era of the big Nashville boom, I'm guessing they picked up a lot of the Garth Brooks audience also, as evidenced by Rucker's eventual turn as a country star. After all, they were a very traditionalist band, their lyrics were very direct, and they built their success the old-fashioned way through relentless touring. So Hootie were basically the band for everybody. And if you want my opinion about it, there's also that, yeah, Cracked Rear View was a pretty solid record with some good singles. Well, Hold My Hand still sucks, I don't like that one. But I do really like the Cornball, Only Want to Be With You, and I do a pretty good Let Her Cry at karaoke. And in the wake of Darius' solo comeback and a big successful Hootie reunion tour this year, some critics have tried to make the case that Hootie was a deserving, worthwhile band. But those defenses definitely do not include Fairweather Johnson. Well, why not? Okay, this is the first single, Old Man and Me. But I wanna... It's, uh, it's okay, I guess. It's about Darius tell some old man he's going off to war. Hooray. War, the old man says, oh, you know, I was once stupid like you, but, you know, war is stupid and you're stupid. And Darius reflects on the old man's wisdom. Mm. Personally, I'm having trouble connecting with it. Respecting your elders is not really a resonant message in 2019. And I can't imagine needing anyone to tell me that war is bad. I know war is bad, but you know, nothing wrong with that either. Nothing super offensive about saying war is bad. Listening to it, you wouldn't at all think it was the song that led to the decline of the Hootie Empire. It sounds exactly the same as the last album. In fact, that might be the problem. In interviews, the band made a big deal about evolving on the second album, getting more mature sound now that they were older and not just fresh out of college. I think what you have is a more mature version of us on that record, you know, a more experienced version. Old Man and Me is the exception. That was an old song from their original demos. So this being the single is the record company playing it safe, giving people more of the hooty sound they loved. But to me, that, that's already a bad sign. It wasn't good enough to get on the first album, now it's good enough to be a lead single? <sighs> Sounds dicey to me. But there was a bigger problem. A problem that would have existed regardless of the songs. And that was a problem of timing. Fairweather Johnson dropped just a couple months after the last single from Cracked Review was released. Cracked Review was still in the top 20, 
selling thousands of copies a week. That's a lot of hootie all at once. You gotta give people time to miss you or, you know, leave people wanting more. Then again, that's also what people told Ariana when she dropped Thank You Next, and she did it anyway, and it worked out pretty well for her. But of course, there's a big difference there, which is, you know, Thank You Next is close to her best work ever. And Fairweather Johnson was not. The sophomore slump happens for a lot of reasons, but the big one is that bands get to polish their first batch of songs for years on the road before they get signed, and then they've only got a few months to write their second. You're not gonna find a better example of that than Hootie. And they only have themselves to blame for it, because rushing out their second album was their idea. They'd been playing the same set for five goddamn years. And apparently, even when you are Hootie and the Blowfish, there's only so much Hootie and the Blowfish you can listen to. They were dying to get out some new ideas. Unfortunately, I don't think they had any. Like, you read the PR and, you know, some of the kinder reviews for Fairweather Johnson, and they talk about how this is the more thoughtful, complex, deeper Hootie with more sophisticated and layered sounds, and reading those reviews makes me feel like I'm losing my goddamn mind. They didn't budge an inch. I can only assume that by more mature and complex, those writers mean that Hootie stopped having hooks or being any fun. Like, there are differences between the first and second album. They're subtle, but they're there. Like, here's how Cracked Rearview starts. See? I'm bouncing right away. Now here's how Fairweather Johnson starts. This is not fun at all. It's minor key and ugly. This is like if someone went up to the band live and were like, I like how miserable and joyless you are, but I kind of wish you had less edge. Could you be wimpier? That first album took a real critical beating, and I guess Hootie got tired of being called lightweights. So I sent some, not trying to upend their sound exactly, but just be a little more respectable. Be artsier, like R.E.M., use a couple heavier riffs like Pearl Jam. But that's like Journey deciding that they're an angry punk band now. No, you're not. You are who you are, guys. Only Wanna Be With You, Hootie's biggest and best song, was not only cheesy as hell, it was about being cheesy. Their lameness was their charm. It's what the people wanted. If anything, they should have been even lamer. Old Man and Me did crack the top 20 for a few weeks, but that would be the last time they ever sniffed the Hot 100. Like, here's the second single, Tuckerstown. Tuckerstown is a place in Bermuda where they recorded the album. And Wikipedia helpfully tells me that the black townspeople were forced off their land there to make room for a resort and golf course. So that's what this song is about, maybe? Actually, I'm going to be straight with you, I have absolutely no idea what this song is about. I think it's about racism. Your father called my name, then his eyes were great of you. But it wasn't me that you were. But honestly, it might just be a breakup song. Like, the pieces are there, but they don't seem to be connecting to each other. I mean, he's sad because of racism and or breakup, so he's gonna go down to Tuckerstown where he can relax. Where I can laugh for free, nobody stares at me, and I'd love to hurt the population. What? Why? What, what population? The white population? The black population? What are you talking about? See, here's the promise Hootie made in their first album. You wouldn't ever have to think very hard about what they meant. You heard them once, and you got it. And it worked. You listen to Let Her Cry, and you've got a very vivid, detailed portrait of a relationship in its bitter end stages. Tuckerstown is vague and half-formed, as is much of the album. There is also one other major difference between albums one and two. Darius's singing has gotten noticeably worse. I mean, he was always easy to make fun of because he sang like this. But on the second album, he really amps it up. He over-emotes everything, and he is basically unintelligible. What the fuck is he saying? I swear to God, he's trying to sing without using consonants. You know what? Why don't we jump to the title track? Easy enough to tell what that one's about. Like the Steelers in 75. 
If you don't know the term, a fairweather fan or a fairweather friend is someone who's only there during the good times and when things start looking bad, they're nowhere. Like yes, this is about sports, all of the blowfish were big sports fans, but there's obviously personal resonance there too. An overnight sensation like Hootie had to have been wondering about their own fans' loyalty. So this is obviously metaphorical. I had more I wanted to say there, but the song's already over. It was a 45 second joke song. It was the best song on the album. I'm not kidding, it was. It was the catchiest song and I knew what it was about. It's the only moment that's not like a dead slog. It's certainly the most memorable. Some reviewers I think were trying to be kind to this album because, you know, they dismissed the first one and then it blew up. There are rumors that legendary critic Jim DeRogatis got fired from Rolling Stone for being too negative about this record. Everyone else is trying to be kind by talking up how many new elements they had. Like there's a tiny bit of accordion on this one song. There's a song called Silly Little Pop Song. Should add some levity. Yeah, a couple barely audible ooh-la-las does not turn your dour-ass song into a breezy pop delight, guys. Like, you could feel all the writers grasping at straws to identify something noteworthy about this record. In the UK, where they had less clout, the critics were not nearly as respectful. London's Time Out magazine called this record duller than dull Dave McDull's duller brother Dennis. I imagine the zero punctuation guy writing that. Even the album art is boring. I look at this record, and I think it's gonna play ambient cricket sounds to help me sleep. In the aftermath, the label denied that the album was a flop. After all, said one executive, it sold 400,000 copies in its first week, so all those people moaning and groaning can stand up their hands. Yeah, everyone connected with them talks like that now, I decided. But in hindsight, it obviously was a flop, because their career slammed to a halt and they never touched the top 40 ever again. And I think that deleted Rolling Stone article has a good point why. It wasn't just a subpar follow-up. They also weren't a good live band. I mean, they were a professional live band. They had to be, they did 300 shows a year. It's just, they had the same DNA and influences and touring schedule as, you know, Fish, Dave Matthews Band, Blues Traveler, all those other jam bands. But Hootie didn't jam. They didn't experiment. I've looked at clips of their live shows at their height. They sound exactly like the CD. He could have just stayed home. There was no variety or spontaneity in them. And that's why, unlike Dave Matthews, they never developed that die-hard cult fan base. The thing about being the band for everyone is that you're also the band for no one. They had no core audience, so as soon as the hits dried up, those giant crowds disappeared. And it's not a sad ending for them, obviously. Darius found his true calling in Nashville, where corny directness is a good thing, and they're on a big reunion tour right now, and honestly, I think they're better now than they were at their height. And I think they all know that Fairweather Johnson was boring. Because when they play their only hit from it, they mash it up with Public Enemy's Fight the Power. Hootie and the Blowfish singing Fight the Power. Now there's something I never thought I'd see. And honestly, I think their new record's kind of good too. But Fairweather Johnson, you can skip. I think ultimately all we can do is write it off as a boring failure. Just like this video. I swear to God, I'll cover like Hulk Hogan's album next time or something. Just anything more interesting than this. So long, everybody.